to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. We're now on episode number 688. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Grays Lake, Illinois. It's Voss Group time. We're going to be opening up today Grace and Glory, sermons preached at Princeton Seminary, talking about the sermon Hungering and Thirsting After Righteousness. And to do that, we have with us Lane Tipton, who is pastor of Trinity OPC in Easton, Pennsylvania, as well as a fellow of biblical and systematic theology here at Reformed Forum. Good morning, Lane. It's good to have you with us again today. Morning, Camden. As always, it is delightful to be here. And we also have, of course, with us our good buddy for these uh, interactions on Voss's sermons, an expert uh, on the subject matter on Gerhardus Voss, indeed the author of uh, the biography that we published a couple years ago. Going to have a second printing of it very, very soon. We have Danny Olinger, General Secretary for the OPC Committee on Christian Education. Welcome back, Danny. It's good to see you as well. Thanks, Ken. We've got uh, a lot lined up, a lot in store, and uh, i got to tell you, I very much enjoyed reading and uh, meditating on this sermon. I did it uh, a couple days ago, but also reflecting on it this morning in preparation of uh, our conversation, Hungering and Thirsting After Righteousness, which is uh, based upon Matthew 5, 6, of course, in the midst of uh, the Beatitudes and, even more broadly, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, looking at uh, Matthew chapters 5 through 7 for that. Uh, This is a tremendous passage and, of course, one people will be uh, very well familiar with. However, we might not think about it necessarily within the larger context and, of course, within the polemical context that Voss was writing in and preaching in. And uh, that is, you know, more than 100 years ago now, most likely, given uh, the, uh, the estimate of when this sermon was preached. Nevertheless, it's still applicable today in the battles that uh, many of the Presbyterians were fighting in America against modernism uh, haven't gone away. They've in some ways uh, changed and taken different forms and come under different headings. Uh, but uh, at heart, uh, we still have the same anthropocentric unbelief <laughs> confronting us. Danny, why don't you tell us a bit about this particular sermon in the context of, of Voss's life and and general corpus. When do you think it was written, and uh, what was he dealing with at the time? Yeah, we do not have an exact date on the sermon, but my guess would be it was written around the time that uh, the teaching of Jesus, uh, his book, The Teaching of Jesus uh, on the Kingdom of God in in the Church in 1903, because at that time he was not only looking into the Gospels, but also dealing with uh, the liberal theories concerning Jesus, that Jesus did not understand himself to be the Messiah. And and Voss was just uh, adamant that this was so wrong. And uh, he was, uh, and at that time, he was a much more polemical. And so I really see this as his Presbyterian conflict sermon. When I read this, my thoughts go immediately to J. Gresson Machen, who Uh, was at Princeton from 1902 to 1905 as a student, and also goes to Cornelius Van Til. I mean, when I read this uh, sermon, I I see how much Machen and Van Til were both building upon Voss and interacting uh, with Voss in regard to confessional Christianity, uh, uh, historical-based Christianity versus the liberal conception of Christianity. Yeah, that really stuck out to me. It also really cemented in my mind um, the just the very basic lesson of communion with God, which, of course, we saw emphasized with the wonderful tree, the last sermon that we looked at. Um, it's refreshing to see this different style of preaching, and even though he is in many ways taking a polemical tack and on the offensive against uh, unbelief and uh, unbelieving interpretations of Matthew 5, 6, modernistic ones. Um, nevertheless, we see a, a call and a reminder to students and faculty and staff at the time at, at the Princeton Theological uh, Cha- Seminary Chapel of the importance of living Coram Deo in the face of God and being a friend of God via the covenant, of course, but then living in a way that is like God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness with a hunger and a thirst that could only come uh, from God himself and draws us into communion with him. So that's that, That's the takeaway I I took, and it was a very um, 
a needed lesson, a good reminder, something we need every day to be drawn near to the Lord. And I appreciate Voss's uh, encouragement to do so more than 100 years later, after the fact, when this was first preached. Why is it, uh, at least why does Voss say, that the uh, the modernists love the Sermon on the Mount, and particularly the Beatitudes so much? How do they view them? How do they interpret them? Yeah, I. Uh, this is such a, an incredible start to a sermon. Um, he goes to the right, right to the heart of liberalism. This is where they 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 take their stand, plant their flag. This is what they think is their trump card. This is where they think they have uh, the uh, Bible believing Presbyterians. <laughs> and Foss says, "Bring it on!" Uh, in that uh, um, he's. He's saying, okay, you're going to say that uh, this is where Christianity, everything that's needed for Christianity is found in this sermon. Um, he's saying, he says point blank, this is a deplorable error. And uh, basically what he's saying is that, okay, uh, you liberals, you have made uh, Christianity into a school, school of ethics in which you are saying that through our good works, uh, we can usher the kingdom into being and uh and he's and he's but he's saying you have a problem you don't want to trash all of the historical understanding of christianity so what you do is you take the last remaining shreds of the garment of a creed and uh and you use it but it's barely sufficient to cover the nakedness of your subjectivity and i i love <laughs> when he says that in the sermon because in your mind's eye, if you are tracking in Scripture, you're thinking of Genesis 3, 7, and 8. And he's saying that the liberals are doing to religion what Adam and Eve attempted to do in the garden after the fall, and that they attempted to cover themselves to their own uh, righteousness to stand before God. And they are exposed uh, for uh, this uh, attempt. And, and so... He, he goes from that basis, and then he says the main reason why they love this is not only do they see it as a, as a, a school of ethics, and, 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 and Boss is saying, no, 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 it's a kingdom of redemption, but the reason that they say it's a school of ethics is because they cannot find the offensive things of a blood atonement there. They believe they cannot find the cross there, and Boss is saying, have you not looked at the context? Have you not looked at Matthew chapter 4? The reason that the disciples are following after Jesus is because they know he is the Savior and that redemption is found in him alone. And that's why they have become acquainted with him and they're following after him. And that's why when he draws them to himself at the beginning uh, to, to, to instruct them to declare uh, this kingdom, uh, this is not about uh, just a good man of some social activists, some environmentalists gathering them together to tell them, this is how you're going to have to live on this earth and through your actions bring in the kingdom of God. No, the kingdom of God has come with the coming of Jesus, and, and this is what it means. And so uh, Boss then, in this sense, is tracking of what he said earlier in the, in the biblical theology in regard to the relationship of the preface of the Ten Commandments to the Ten Commandments uh, themselves. In the Bible, you're never going to have bare ethical command. It is built upon the redemptive work of God, which proceeds. And he lays it out, uh, and you guys have done such a great job when you went through that section of the Decalogue and the biblical theology. But uh, that is, uh, so what liberalism has done is they've ripped apart the understanding of, of the way that redemption precedes ethics in biblical religion. And that does affect one's communion with the living God. Yeah, I mean, Voss's insistence, you know, con contra the, the modernists, that Jesus is ushering in a kingdom of redemption, not a school of ethics, is really so much at the heart and at the center of this I appreciate the the insistence in Voss's reminder of the context in which Matthew five through seven is is given. It doesn't just fall out of the sky. They want to treat it as as a unit of itself, and they love the Beatitudes primarily because of what they do not say. 
<laughs> so it's like this is a convenient portion of scripture where uh, it doesn't have all of the inconvenient things they don't like, as you mentioned, atonement and whatnot. But Voss also very early on emphasizes the the nature of this kingdom as a kingdom of redemption, but also the blessedness that is promised uh, comes in the consummation. And everything mentioned is very contrary to worldly means and and and, and whatnot, and and is very much opposed to a, a, a form of social religion. So even on its own terms, if all you were reading was the Beatitudes, it still doesn't present you know the a form of a social gospel or a man centered religion because those who triumph or those who come to consummation and receive blessedness are the opposite of what we might expect. It's the poor in spirit, the mourners, the meek those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And uh, Voss, in a sense, really flips flips things on its head. So it's interesting here, Danny, perhaps in 1903, if this was circa 1903 when this was written, that the, that these, these themes are so much present on his mind because we see that overlap of the ages even beginning this early. Is this something we see in other works at the time, even, um, you know, in uh, the Messianic, the self-consciousness of Jesus and other other portions, his work on the kingdom? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so he was uh, a reading about uh, the Messianic self-consciousness at this time. He would not publish uh, articles on it until uh, over a decade later, around 1915, 16, 17. He published a series of articles, and then he uh, brought them together in 1926 for his book, The Self-Disclosure of Jesus. And so when I read Hungry and Thirsting for Righteousness, and I have the time, I often go and when we'll read the first chapter of the self-disclosure, because there he puts it all together for what's going on in that he believes that, and this is what Machen and him were, were so agreed upon, that liberalism is another religion. It's not a related religion. It's another religion. And uh, so this sermon helps to bring that out in that um, the Messiah has come. And, and this is something I'd, I'd like to hear, Lane. I love when Voss says in regard to the Messiah coming, that here in the Sermon on the Mount, that uh, the doctrine of salvation is present because of Jesus Christ is present. He's the living doctrine incarnate. And and in that regard, that gets to what you said, Ken, at the very beginning in regard to the communion with the living God. He says in the self-disclosure in that opening chapter that liberalism can only get you to a, frag a fragmented, superficial acquaintance with Jesus. And you cannot get to that living communion with God and with living communion with the risen Christ. And because of that, he's, he's going to say that religiously, liberalism can never satisfy. And that's where I believe that I, I, I hear the strong voice of Cornelius Van Til in my, in my you know, mind when Voss says that, because Van Til is always coming back to that. Uh, only a biblical religion satisfies because you've been brought into this communion with, with the living God. And so in, in, in that sense, um, uh, again, it comes back to the fact that the disciples understand themselves as sinners. They understand themselves without hope. And their hope is found in Jesus. And that hope has brought them into a communion with him that is living and real. And it plays out then as they do seek after him. Uh, in seeking to obey his word and bring, reflect his glory. It's lived out on the basis of, of, of grace. But uh, Lane, I love it when he talks, you know, he's getting at in regard to certain aspects of law keeping in that in, in at the Old Testament law keeping, uh, the automation of the law had taken the place of the living God. And it seems to me as if he's he's really telling us that liberalism has has put something else that's taken place of the living God, and what you have left is not not really Christianity. Yeah, it's uh, it's as though liberalism has taken the very worst of the error that abstracted God from the law, 
and perpetuated it in a kind of anti-supernaturalist ethical direction. And the re I think one of the reasons why Voss finds this such a pernicious move is that uh, in light of your comment, Danny, about uh, biblical theology, page 132, and it's bearing on this, is that the, the whole purpose of the giving of the law and of law keeping is to promote the redemptive securing of a fundamentally God-centered expression of worship and communion. Um, so that when you're thinking about the law, you're not thinking about a merit system of ascending into God's presence uh, through condign merit. You're not thinking about a social or political or environmental program. Really what law keeping has as its fundamental propension is knowing and communing in worship and obedience with the living God himself. And so there's something not only God-centered, but living and vibrant, something that suffuses piety into the heart when you understand law-keeping as uh, a means to the end of fellowship with the living God, possessing him, knowing him, communing with him, and being formed in righteousness uh, as as a gift and as a power being formed in his image likeness. So yeah, it's it's Voss does such a wonderful job here. You can you can hear the anticipation of Christianity and liberalism, and Voss is hitting it at a deep deep level of of a thorough. What does a thoroughgoing God centeredness mean for law keeping? It means everything. Brothers, I'm interested in on that exact point uh, in Voss's insistence that this godlikeness and this he doesn't exactly use these terms, but terms that we've been using particularly recently in the last few years here at Reformed Forum, but this covenantal image conformity, we're being conformed to the image of the resurrected Christ. So to be righteous is to be godlike, and and to follow after the law as a matter of obedience is to live and fulfill the image of God, which we're called to be like him. But the purpose of that isn't first and form, foremost uh, for our own ends or our own our own um, benefit, even though it is a great benefit to follow after the law and be like God. The overarching significance is for God's own glory and his lordship and possession over us that we, his people, those made in his image, would be instruments of revelation to reveal his very character to the world. And that is just so opposite <laughs> of a modernist concern, and even opposite of just a basic anthropocentric, a man-centered religion, that even our demonstration of righteousness has within it uh, the very glory of God and, and his, his, uh, his own purposes at the center. Yeah, that's, that's well put. And I, I thought the same thing reading this sermon. And I believe uh, another text that he has in view that's in the background is Isaiah 6 uh, because of, of the reflecting of the glory of God uh, in the world and what it means for the creature, particularly for the creature who has come to the end of himself and knows that this is the one in, what, in whom his goodness is found and knowing uh, that, uh, you know, what his purpose is. And, and so, um, again, I think that what Voss is saying is you do not have to go down this ethical line, this, this horrible substitution uh, in order to have those uh, who live in a manner that brings glory to God in this earth. Rather, it's quite the opposite because uh, what's going to happen if you're, if you're separated from the risen Christ or the living Christ, uh, you have not only not, you don't have the strength to do it, but it ends up becoming something um, in which uh, you go through the motions, but your heart is is not there, and 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 so you know, uh, well, you know, does the prophet say, you know, this people honors me uh, with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and so he's getting, he's again, he is really, it is a, it's a death blow to liberalism. He is he is crushing them uh, in this. So how does one then attain this righteousness to get back at this God? centeredness and this uh, away from anthropocentrism 
towards a God-centeredness and uh, really an understanding of monergism, how is it that one can hunger and thirst after righteousness? And how does, how does Voss present that contra the modernists? Yeah, I think that he, uh, the, the, the recognition of your own sinfulness is a starting point. The recognition that you are not righteous in and of yourself, um, and that even the um, even that that you come to that understanding of something that's planted in your heart by God, it's all of God from beginning to end, and and that's why God is to receive the glory. And so, um, and so those then who know that they are sinners, you know, there's a Jew that he says that lives in the heart of every one of us, you know, thinking we can, can do this. Once that is broken and we come to an end of ourselves, then those disciples who know that their only hope is is found in Jesus are those who pursue after Jesus as if uh, he was the only thing necessary in this life. Just as, you know, gold and silver cannot sustain you in this life, uh, uh, you can't eat gold and silver. Uh, So once you know that Jesus is your only hope, nothing else satisfies, nothing else sustains uh, he is everything of, uh, to your life. And uh, so that's when Paul says um, to hunger and thirst after a thing means the recognition that without that thing, there can be no life. And that's uh, for the, the Christian uh, who realizes that they are poor in spirit, uh, the meek, the humble, uh, those who are persecuted, uh, you know, they, they come to that recognition that it's only found in Jesus. How, how much uh, is Voss emphasizing the Ordo Salutis here? Not to the not to the exclusion of Historia Salutis, and of course the the person and work of Christ that's central, that's that's on display here, especially with the idea that Christ is ushering in a kingdom of redemption. But nevertheless, we do, of course, have aspects of the Ordo Salutis as we ought to if we're thinking about this. Um, do we notice uh, anything interesting regarding the way he presents these? I mean, thinking more broadly about his own development of thought. I would say yes, but I'd love to hear what Lane would have to say here, because there's a movement in the sermon from conviction of sin, then he talks about justification, then he talks about sanctification. Um, so it's an interesting movement that he he makes there. So what, what struck your eye there, Lane? Um, what struck my eye is that uh, when Voss is situating what hungering and thirsting for righteousness is, it is something that presupposes the fundamental emptiness of the creature and the fact that only God can fill the creature with what brings lasting satisfaction for the hungering and thirsting. And so uh, one of the texts that Voss quotes in this sermon is Psalm 73, 25 through 26. What, whom do I have in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth I desire but you, O God. So that, that what's framing Voss's understanding of the nature of the image, the fundamental loss that comes uh, of original righteousness and the corruption of the whole nature and the guilt of sin in sin, And the way redemption functions is to bring about the creation of a hungering and thirsting for righteousness that is God himself, that God himself supplies the fulfillment of that for which the believer hungers and thirsts. And so I think the way to start to frame that question about the ordo salutis and the, the, the point you're making, Danny, about the movement from conviction of sin to justification, sanctification, is that justification and sanctification serve the end of God himself being the one who brings satisfaction to the hungering and thirsting, who satisfies the hunger, who slakes the thirst. Um, And he does so in the one, namely Jesus. And this is one of my favorite uh, quotes here. Um, I'll try not to read too much of it, but um, his his reference to Jesus on page um, one, on page 45, that um, in the incarnate reality of Jesus himself, um, he was 
in his human nature an altar from which the incense of perfect consecration rose ceaselessly day and night. And in that, you find the one who, in his humanity, perfectly hungered and thirsted for righteousness, and we share in him and in his full satisfaction. So there's the historia salutis in Christ. Hungering and thirsting bring being brought to the satisfaction of his soul. And then justification and sanctification subserve our sharing in Christ, who himself, by his obedience and satisfaction, and by virtue of our union with him, brings about the quote unquote prophecy Voss is talking about of our hunger and thirst being satisfied in God and in God-given righteousness that is in Christ and reunion with. Him. So I, I think that might be one way to think about it. He's he's got a place for the ordo, but the but justification and sanctification are unto the end of finding satisfaction in God Himself in union and communion with Christ. It's interesting he situates justification and sanctification only after saying those things. Yeah, I, I, I like what you said about uh, Psalm 73. Uh, in the wonderful tree and now in hungry and thirsting and righteousness, it's interesting that he kind of, there's three texts that he's, he kind of comes back to. Um, that's one of them. Genesis 17, 1 is one of them. And he keeps on ending his sermons with Psalm 7, uh, 17, 15. So it's interesting you think about it. Um, the first one of, of, of Genesis 17 and walking after God and knowing God and, and entering into uh, that covenant covenant relationship, which God has brought, uh, Abraham has brought us, Abraham's seed, being motivated, Psalm 73, uh, uh, in the pilgrimage by the fact that God and God alone is man's highest good unto the end that uh, we'll be satisfied in the consummation that when we will awake, we will see God. And then uh, seeing that as the Old Testament promise, and then the, the fulfillment of that in the coming of Jesus Christ in bringing of the kingdom and all that he has done. And to Foss, it's, 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 it's the perfect fulfillment of all of those texts is found uh, in Christ. And so it gets, he sees the organic nature of the scripture and he sees when you come to the Sermon on the Mount, then you're not, you, you, what has changed is the Messiah has come. The second Adam is on the scene. What has not changed is the biblical religion at its heart in that this communion that exists between God and his creature. I love that. I think that is a helpful, a tremendously helpful way to approach the issue is over perhaps maybe the last 10 or 15 years, there have been camps within reform circles that often want to pit a historical or redemptive historical or historia salutis focused view of salvation against an ordo salutis view. But the two always have to go together. And and we don't have redemption uh, applied without redemption having been accomplished. No one, no orthodox person denies that. And so to, ha- to insist upon uh, a focus and a priority of, of union with Christ an emphasis upon being united to Christ does not mean you obliterate the aspects of uh, salvation that we find so helpfully detailed in the Reformation and post, you know, Reformation reform scholastics. You know, we we ha- absolutely must get into the finer points and all the details of the doctrines of justification, adoption, and sanctification, and and uh, glorification. But all of those are given with a larger purpose that we would be drawn near to the Lord, made like him, so that Christ would be the firstborn of many brothers. We're being conformed to his image. And the purpose of all these aspects is the overarching purpose of God's glory revealed in and through his people who are made like him and brought to get to into his glorious presence. So when we're justified, we are declared righteous. And, you know, forensically, we possess Christ's righteousness. It's an alien righteousness, but we're like him in that we have his righteousness. We're clothed in his righteous robes. When we're sanctified, we also are put to, our our old man is put to death and we are made more and more like him in the fact that our old nature is dying uh, more and more each day and we're being raised to a newness of life. We have a holiness about us and uh, sin no longer has a lordship or, or dominion over us. 
uh, but we are slaves to righteousness. When we're adopted, we're no longer aliens, outsiders, but we're brought into his family. We have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. We're more like Christ in that regard. We're brought closer to him. So for me, pitting uh, you know, an older Voss against a later Voss or, you know, different aspects of Voss where here he's Forenza centric and here he's, you know, maybe more, you know, God centered is, is kind of borders on being ridiculous because the both, both of them are, are present. And we see just this, this just devastating God centeredness to this sermon, devastating to the modernist concern, but also it, it helps understand helps us to interpret and understand the ordo salutis aspects of it within that overarching construct. And it's basically just a covenantal theology, <laughs> a relation to God, living like him and following after him as the only person, the only being, the only thing in life that can fulfill what we were created to be and to do. Uh, we're made in the image of God and without the Lord, uh, you know, we'll never ultimately be happy. We'll be lacking. That's why we need to hunger and thirst after righteousness, not because righteousness is disconnected or some other thing out there, but because righteousness is God himself, his very character. And that gets back to uh, why I think polemically, uh, why uh, those like Voss and uh, Machen and Fantil and others were willing to give up so much on, on on this issue in regard to what was going on in Presbyterianism in that, uh, you know, Foss says at the end of the sermon that Jesus was, uh, is conscious of carrying uh, the source and substance of the blessings of the kingdom of God in his own person. And that is why he can declare in the Sermon on the Mount, I say unto you. And if you, if you strip the Sermon on the Mount, of that, of that Jesus, the divine Jesus, uh, the God-man, then you've stripped religion at its very essence, biblical religion. There's nothing left. And uh, so, um, you know, the centrality of Jesus and what God has done in bringing us into this relationship, the saving relationship, is, is Christianity. There, there, there's no other Christianity. And, um, and so that is the foundation from which... Uh, then doctrinally we proceed, and uh, and so in that sense, um, you know this this gets to the fact that um, there's so many things we could say, but I I think of Machen. Machen years later um, in the Presbyterian conflict, finally you know as the it was apparent that the uh, a new church was going to have to be formed, what became what we now know as the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, he believed that the church should be defined not only by a Christ-centeredness, but by a broken heart. And there's no way in a school of ethics, if that is what Christianity is, that you could ever get to a broken heart. But if you know it's a kingdom of redemption in which you owe everything to your God and you have failed your God, then a broken heart is the first step unto knowing that you cannot save yourself and your entire hope rests in, in Jesus. And, and, and then, you know, uh, you know, blessed is the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God or blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness uh, for they shall be satisfied. Amen. So, you know, uh, well, preaching to the choir, I'm sure, but uh, I just, uh, sometimes, you know, I, I just know that, the complaint comes, well, can't you let well enough be? Can't you, <laughs> you know, just let it go? Those of us who no, because Jesus will not let it go. And the question is, you know, will we receive Jesus at his word or not? That's really the question I think of the sermon ultimately. Who is Jesus? And he's our Savior and Lord. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is proclaiming. Yeah, yeah Danny, just a, a, a thought to piggyback on what you're saying. I think the this um, I'm going to use a term that summarizes I think Voss, Machen, and Van Til following Jesus here. They are militant about this, and the thing that I think a lot of people miss is they misconstrue militancy as chest thumping pride and uh, pounding on dogmatic issues. 
the entire point here is that the militancy is a is joined to cross-bearing and brokenheartedness when this is not seen. Um, it's not simply that we look at the liberal position and say, what a screaming pile of Socinianism <laughs> or or, you know, wh- how right. in the world could someone be so fundamentally Pelagian right. and then look down in some condescending way upon them and pronounce um, a curse upon them? Rather, it's like a pharisaical uh yeah. Uh, view uh, of, of doctrinalism, you know, thank yeah. you, Lord, that I'm not like these other ignorant yeah. people in their theology. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah that's often how, uh, since people have, have coined the term, we never coined it, Machen's Warrior Children, that's how they view Machen Warrior Children. But if you if you understand Machen and Voss and Van Til and those in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church who are trying self-consciously to follow there, this is, this, this um, lack, a failure to see this God-centered, cross-stamped, spirit-produced, union-gifted, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for going everything in this world for the sake of the truth of the, the, the purity of the worship of God in Christ, as he's revealed in Scripture, true hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It is the, the breaking of the heart of the righteous to see that spurned. And so the irony here is that the militancy is for the brokenhearted. And it's the brokenhearted who, just because of that broken heart, won't let go of the militancy because they won't let go of Jesus who produces both. Amen. So, Danny, uh, it's important also then to realize how all of this comes about. Uh, Voss addresses, you know, the, the, the thought maybe that Jesus could bring about this kingdom and he, that he could change sin and guilt into righteousness by a mere fiat of his will. But that's not what happens, and that's not what Jesus understands his, his role to be. Rather, he's a suffering servant. How does, how does this character also fit, or, or this, this understanding of Jesus' own messianic ministry inform our own lives and place within this kingdom? Yeah, just like, uh, so Foss believes biblically that ethics is always proceeds from redemption. He believes that the subjective must be connected to the objective, uh, but he also is all, will always come back uh, to the active and passive obedience of Christ. So Christ is not only the one who fulfills the law perfectly. Um, he and he and Paul says uh, he he kept the law here from that sanctuary of his inner life, where he and his father. Uh, always beheld each other's face. I mean, so that that intimate communion, that living communion, that eternal communion between the Son and the Father, but yet at the same time, because he so loved us, uh, he submitted to the cross and endured the shame because of our sin, so that uh, not uh, the divine justice sh- uh, would be fulfilled. And, and so in that sense, again, it gets back to liberalism saying, why do we like the Sermon on the Mount? There's no cross here. There's no blood atonement. We, we don't have those horrific things that we know better about as, as moderns. And, and Voss is saying, no, no, no. This is the very basis of everything that's being taught here is that Jesus going to the cross and enduring the shame that we might have life. Um, so in, in that sense, I think it's a wonderful way to end the uh, sermon in that he's, he's talking about that aspect of Christ's work on our behalf unto the end that we will be in heaven with God, where we will see Jesus face to face, and we will no longer hunger and thirst at that time, because the meek at that point will have inherited the earth. Um, and there's nothing there's nothing halfway about the second clauses of this Beatitudes in heaven. It's a full, absolute fulfillment that we will be brought into. We have a foretaste now through the work of Christ, but in that day, we shall be fully satisfied because when we awake, we will see Christ's face in, uh, as we dwell with him. Mm. Lane, do we have here uh, the promise that uh, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will participate in the divine essence? If if we do, uh, we should just head to Rome. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, um, I think I uh, know. No, you're kidding. It's it's a fun thing to joke about, I guess. But um, well, the, it's uh, it's the topic du jour. 
And, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, but all kidding aside, I, I do think that um, the 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 theme. Notice the theme that Voss leaves us on. It's not um, being ontologically reproportioned and assimilated into the essence of God and transcending human nature. It's rather through the perfection of the natural religious fellowship that Jesus had with his father in his incarnate uh, traversing of humiliation to exaltation, that natural religious fellowship perfected, not ontologically reproportioned, it's that that brings us our satisfaction in union and communion with him and in personal fellowship with God. So um, in, in all you know, in all seriousness, it it really is, um, on the one side, we want to eschew the school of ethics, of liberalism. On the other side, I think we want to eschew the school of participating in the essence on the other side um, and and go where Voss leads us, which is the, the traversing of the estate of humiliation and exaltation in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the fruition of our union and communion with him given his active and passive obedience on earth and its transformation into a resurrected and glorified state of per perfect communion where Psalm 1715 says that we will in the perfection of his perfected fellowship with his father in glory, see his face and be fully satisfied. Um, as we bear his image and likeness in true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. And that natural religious fellowship through redemption is perfected in covenant. And it is just a, a beautiful and, and breathtaking prospect uh, where Voss leaves us. And uh, so in, I think so enriching for those of us who know and continue to pursue that deeper Protestant conception. Yeah, absolutely. That's what's really important, of course, to emphasize and connect this to what Voss says in his Reformed Dogmatics. That deeper Protestant conception, one of our favorite phrases, just encapsulates the idea that God made man in his image for the purpose of religious fellowship with him. That is made possible through a voluntary condescension on God's part, which he hath been pleased to express by way of covenant, to use our Westminster uh, confession language. So through that covenant, uh, God brings about what he originally intended. And man, as created in the image of God, already has within him the capability and the potential to be brought into that fellowship, that consummate, glorious, beatific vision. So to connect that, you know, to other concerns that we have and what Lane was already mentioning does not require an ontological reproportioning, does not require that man would somehow be made or transcend his own being to become something other than human. But it's a perfecting of and a consummation of man's original being as created. But now it's through redemption. Of course, we don't need to rehearse all of this, but now we, we do not enter into this through a covenant of works uh, because Adam failed, but now we enter into it through a covenant of grace. And Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, brings us to the terminus, the end point, the goal, the telos, the new heavens and the new earth, which were the original promise to Adam in the first place. That's the deeper Protestant conception that eschatology precedes soteriology. You can get a mug like this in our online store if you'd like. But anyway, <laughs> to connect that back, it all comes back to uh, to those basic lessons with Voss. And uh, even if we don't read them explicitly, they're, they're definitely there in his mind and certainly in the background of sermons like this, which are a tremendous example and a reminder for us, especially as as those with the great and high privilege to proclaim the gospel as, as ambassadors and as ministers of the gospel, to, uh, to preach Christ, crucified and raised for sinners, but not as some external person who just, you know, gives us benefits, <laughs> but to preach Christ as the one uh, to whom we're oriented, but also the one who is our very life, the vine, we're the branches. He's the one that provides life. And that's what I love, just those basic, basic lessons 
that even a child, a very young child, should be able to understand it. If we're not preaching those lessons, if those don't infuse our, our sermons, our lessons, our daily devotions, our discourse with others, when we're rising, when we're sitting, then we've, we're missing something. We're missing the very heart of Christianity to begin with. So thanks, Danny. Thanks, Lane, for, for talking through this sermon. We look forward to uh, picking up next time. What's the next one in order, Danny? What's, uh, what's sermon number three? Seeking and Saving the Lost, uh, his great sermon on Zacchaeus and uh, Jesus, uh, Luke, uh, from Luke's Gospel. Oh, that's going to be great. We'll get into that soon enough. I imagine the next time we have Voss Group, we'll be back in biblical theology, working through uh, the pages they're in, uh, talking about prophetic revelation and whatnot. If you want to follow up and uh, get back in the archives, all the episodes we've ever done are available Online, You can find them at reformedforum.org. We even have archival uh, RSS feeds. So if, if you're in the your podcast app of choice and it doesn't go back far enough, uh, you can browse in the footer of our website. There should be a link for more feeds. And there are some archival feeds because we had 688 episodes now. It's just technically not practical to have all the episodes in the feed all at the same time, but they're there. They're available. So you can subscribe to the archival feeds going all the way back to episode one. It can be maybe painful to listen to those old episodes, even more painful than it might be for you to listen to these. But uh, they're there, and they're available. And if you need some technical help, you can send us a note at mail at reformedforum.org, and uh, one of us will be happy to get back to you and try to figure all these things out. But until then, we do want to thank everybody for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.